Chapter Zero of the Story of the Atlantic Cable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright. Prefatory Note The Jubilee of Submarine Telegraphy having lately been achieved, and that connected with the Atlantic Cable being somewhat close at hand, it has been thought a suitable moment for the appearance of this little volume. In these days when the substitution of submarine cables by wireless telegraphy systems is a subject of common talk, it may be well to pause for a moment and contemplate the period of time covered by the gradual evolution of old and existing methods, which at length achieved the result we now enjoy, a practical commercial telegraphic system between all the nations of the world, and notably between the United Kingdom and America. By a somewhat curious coincidence, the engineer of the first Atlantic cable accomplished his achievement at practically the same youthful age, twenty-six, as Mr. Marconi when first transmitting signals across the Atlantic without any intervening wires. C.B., 21 Old Queen Street, Westminster, Southwest, October, 1903. Part 1. Introductory. The Electric Telegraph. The advances made in electric science are so bold and rapid that our still comparative ignorance of the precise nature of electricity must always seem strange. We are not, however, here directly concerned with electricity as a physical science but rather with its practical applications to the still present system of telegraphy, by way of introduction to the gradual development of transatlantic telegraphy. The electric telegraph, together with the railway train and the steamship, constitute the three most conspicuous features of latter-day civilization. Indeed, it may be truly said that the harnessing of this force of nature, electricity, to the service of man for human intercourse, has effected a change in political, commercial, and social relations even more complete than that wrought by steam locomotion. Like its fellow emblems, the telegraph was the outcome of many years of persevering effort on the part of numerous scientific investigators and inventors. Like them, also, it was perfected for practical use on both sides of the Atlantic by men of our own race and speech, such as Cook, Wheatstone and Morse. The First Land Telegraphs The first practical telegraph line in the world, namely that on the Great Western Railway from Paddington to West Drayton, shortly afterward extended to Slow, was within the year of Queen Victoria's accession to the throne, and in the same year as the first trunk line of railway and the first ocean steamer improvements and novelties in telegraphic instruments were rapidly made by inventors from all the civilized nations that is morse vale and henry in america brejway in france steinheil and siemens and halsk in germany and schilling in russia besides alexander bain bright and hughes in england commercial interests were soon formed to work the new invention and in England the Electric and International Telegraph Company, the British and Irish Magnetic Telegraph Company, and other large concerns were the means of establishing telegraphic communication throughout the kingdom, only to be absorbed by the government later on. Our theme does not include, even in the course of introduction, a study of the development of land telegraphy. The apparatus and methods employed are to a great extent entirely different, indeed the only point in common between the cardinal principles and submarine telegraphy is that electricity as generated by a voltaic battery is the common agent and consequently the metal conducting wire is employed in both but in subaqueous as well as in subterranean telegraphy the poles and the porcelain insulators require to be substituted by an insulating covering round the entire conductor, and the point of contact in practice between land and marine telegraphy is really therefore in the matter of insulation for subterranean or subaqueous wires. 
first submarine cables. A Spaniard named Salva appears to have suggested the feasibility of submarine telegraphy as far back as 1795, and in 1811 Summering and Schilling conducted a series of experiments, more or less practical, when a soluble material, said to have been India rubber, was first used for insulating the wire. But the earnest records of practical telegraphy under water, of which there are any particulars, relate to the experiments conducted by Dr. O'Shaughnessy, afterwards Sir William O'Shaughnessy Brook, F.R.S., across the river Hooghly, on behalf of the East Indian Company in 1838. Referring to his practical researches a little later, O'Shaughnessy remarked, Insulation, according to my experiments, is best accomplished by enclosing the wire, previously pitched, in a split rattan, and then paying the rattan round with tarred yarn, or the wire may, as in some experiments by Colonel Palsy, R.E., at Chatham, be surrounded by strands of tarred rope, and this by pitched yarn. An insulated rope of this kind may be spread across a wet field, nay, even led through a river, and will still conduct the electrical signals, without any appreciable loss. In 1840, Professor Wheatstone, afterwards Sir Charles Wheatstone, F.R.S., explained to a committee of the House of Commons the methods by which he thought it possible to establish telegraphic communication between Dover and Calais. He appears to have been unaware of the prior experiments just alluded to, for his system of insulation, though more fully developed, was practically the same. Professor S. F. B. Morse, the well-known inventor of the telegraph apparatus bearing his name, also made a study of this problem in 1842, when he laid down an insulated copper wire across New York Harbor, through which he transmitted electric currents. Hemp, soaked in tar and pitch, surrounded with a layer of India rubber, constituted the insulation. Morse was a great letter writer, and records of his early work are solely based on his own statements at a time when he noted in his diary I am crushed for want of means. My stockings all want to see my mother, and my hat is hoary with age. In 1845, Ezra Cornell, who was afterward the founder of Cornell University, laid a cable twelve miles long in the Hudson River to connect Fort Lee with New York. The cable consisted of two cotton-covered copper wires insulated with India rubber and enclosed in a leaden pipe. It worked well for several months, but was broken by ice in 1846. In that year, Mr. Charles West paid out by hand an India rubber insulated wire in Portsmouth Harbor, through which he signaled from a boat to the shore. The experiment was intended as the forerunner of the establishment of telegraphic communication between England and France, but for want of the necessary funds was not followed up. Subaqueous or marine telegraphy owed its institution, however, to the introduction of gutta percha for insulating purposes. The late Dr. Werner Siemens, having invented a machine for applying gutta percha to a wire, similar in principle to the machine for making macaroni, considerable lengths of gutta percha covered subterranean wires were laid in Germany and Prussia between 1846 and 1849 and in 1849 Siemens laid a gutta-percha insulated conductor in the harbor of Kiel, which was used for firing mines. Following this came the extensive system of underground lines laid down in England for the Magnetic Telegraph Company by their engineer, Mr. afterwards Sir Charles Bright, in accordance with a patent of his, Short lengths were also laid, mostly through tunnels, by the Electric Telegraph Company a little later. On the 10th day of January, 1849, the late Mr. C. V. Walker, F.R.S., electrician to the Southeastern Railway, laid a gutta-percha-covered conductor two miles long in the English Channel. The wire was coiled on a drum on board the laying vessel, from which it was paid out as the vessel progressed, 
Starting from the beach at Folkestone, the line was joined up to an aerial wire 83 miles in length along the southeastern railway, and Mr. Walker, on board the Princess Clementine, succeeded in exchanging telegrams with London. On the 23rd July, 1845, the brothers Jacob and John Watkins Brett addressed themselves to Sir Robert Peel as Prime Minister and First Lord of the Treasury, relative to a proposal of theirs for establishing a general system of telegraphic communication, oceanic and otherwise. They were referred to the Admiralty, Foreign Office, etc., and gradually became involved in a departmental correspondence, more academic than useful, in which they were passed backward and forward from one government office to another. After considerable negotiations with both governments concerned, a concession was at last obtained by the Messrs. Brett, and a company formed for instituting telegraphy between England and France, by means of a line from Dover to Calais. Twenty-five nautical miles of number 14 copper wire, covered with half-inch thickness of gutta-percha, was then manufactured, the electrician's tongue being the only test applied to some of the lengths. The shore ends for about two miles from each terminus consisted of a number 16 BWG conductor, covered with cotton soaked in India rubber solution, the whole being encased in a very thick lead tube. The rest of the line was composed of the gutta-percha insulated wire above described, with thirty-pound leaden weights fastened to it at hundred-yard intervals, the laying vessel having to be stopped each time one was put on. The submersion of the line was successfully effected, but it only lived to speak a few more or less incoherent words, one being a short complimentary communication to Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, shortly afterward Emperor of the French. It subsequently transpired that a Boulogne fisherman had hooked up the line with his trawl, mistaking it for a new kind of seaweed. This enterprise excited little attention at the time. It was, in fact, regarded as a mad freak, and even as a gigantic swindle. When accomplished, the Times remarked, in the words of Shakespeare, the jest of yesterday has become the fact of today, and a few hours later it might with equal truth have been said that the fact of yesterday has become the jest of today. The feasibility of laying such a line, and of transmitting electric signals across the channel, had, however, been proved. The signals obtained had, moreover, the effect of eradicating the then very prevalent belief that even if the line were successfully submerged, the current would become dissipated in the water. It now remained to find a satisfactory method of protecting the insulated conductor from injury during and after laying. The excellence of the insulating material was recently testified to when some portions were recovered. Though the above line was not, practically speaking, turned to any account, it was by no means abortive, for the signals it had conveyed were sufficient to save the concession, which was renewed by the French government on December 19, 1850. But the previous failure had made capitalists distrustful, and only some weeks before the expiration of the time limit the necessary funds had not been raised. Dover to Calais, 1850-51 The undertaking was saved by the energy and talent of one man, Mr. T. R. Crampton, an eminent railway engineer. He raised the necessary capital, 15,000 pounds, putting his own name down for half this amount, and being joined by Lord de Molly and the late Sir James Carmichael, he, Mr. Crampton, also settled the type of cable to be laid, based on the iron pit rope. This, in one form or another, practically remains the type of today. The cable contained four copper conducting wires of number 16 BWG, each one covered with two layers of gutta percha to number one gauge. These four insulated conductors, or cores, were laid together and the interstices filled up with strands of tarred Russian hemp. The outer covering consisted of ten galvanized iron wires of number one gauge wound spirally round the bundle of cores. 
this armor was provided with a view to protecting the insulated conductors from the strains and chafing which had so seriously interfered with the chances of the previous line the completed cable weighed about seven tons to the mile it was coiled into the hold of an old pontoon hulk which was then taken in tow by two steamers a third tug to stand by, and a small man-of-war steamer to act as pilot, accompanied the laying expedition. The cable was landed at the foot of the South Foreland Lighthouse, and paid out toward Cape Sangat, but the weather was less favorable than on the previous occasion. Moreover, the weight of the cable, in the absence of efficient holding back gear, caused it to run out too rapidly, notwithstanding the slight depth some thirty fathoms encountered added to this the tugs drifted with the wind and tide thus when the vessels arrived within about a mile of the french coast no more cable was left on board and a fresh length had to be procured and spliced on before the line was complete this cable proved a lasting success it underwent numerous and extensive repairs and it was only quite recently that its abandonment took place. OTHER EARLY CABLES The success of Crampton's line gave considerable impetus to submarine telegraphy. Similar enterprises sprung up on all sides, but many failures occurred before these operations came to be regarded as ordinary industrial undertakings. In the course of the following year, 1852, three unsuccessful attempts were made to establish telegraphic communication between England and Ireland. In the first, between Holyhead and Howth, the cable was not heavy enough to contend with the rough bottom and strong currents and disturbances from anchors experienced in these waters. But this undertaking is remarkable as being the only instance in which an effort was made to do without any intermediate serving between the insulated conductor and the iron sheathing. In the second attempt, between Port Patrick, Scotland, and Donaghadi, Ireland, the cable consisted of a central copper conductor, covered first with India rubber, then with gutta percha, and then hemp outside all this cable being far too light was actually carried away by the strong tidal currents and even broken into pieces during laying in the third endeavor between the same two points the arrangements for checking the cable while paying out being again inadequate there was not sufficient to reach the farther shore however in eighteen fifty three a heavy cable weighing seven tons per mile with six conductors was successfully laid for the Magnetic Telegraph Company by the late Sir Charles Bright. This was in upward of a hundred and eighty fathoms, the deepest water in which a cable was laid for some time, and proved a permanent success, forming the first establishment of telegraphic communication with Ireland. Only a year elapsed before it became evident that another cable was required to meet the traffic between England and the continent, and an additional line was laid from Dover to Ostend. Anglo-Dutch and Anglo-German cables followed in due course, and in less than ten years from the commencement of its operations over the first channel cable, the Submarine Telegraph Company, since absorbed by the state, was working at least half a dozen really excellent cables, varying from twenty-five to a hundred and seventeen miles in length, connecting England with the rest of Europe. During the next few years, submarine communication was established between Denmark and Sweden, as well as between Italy, Corsica, and Sardinia, and between Sardinia and the north coast of Africa. But where successful, the measures adopted were in the main similar to those we have already described in connection with the preceding lines, though special conditions were in some instances the means of introducing certain modifications and improvements several serious failures were however experienced in the deep water of the mediterranean which had a detracting effect in the public mind on the chances of the great undertaking which was to follow end of chapter zero recording by maria casper chapter one of the story of the atlantic cable this is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright. Part 2 The Pioneer Line. Chapter 1 Evolution of Atlantic Telegraphy in America and England. As has been shown in the introductory chapter, the efforts of the early projectors of submarine telegraphy were at first confined to connecting countries divided only by narrow seas, or establishing communication between points on the same seaboard. The next step forward, with which we are here immediately concerned, was the spanning of the Atlantic Ocean between Europe and America. It was aptly characterized at the time as the great feat of the century. By its means the people of the two continents were to speak together in a few moments, though separated by a vast ocean. This was the first venture in transoceanic telegraphy. There was no applicable data to go upon for the vast difference between laying short cable lengths across rivers, bays, etc., in shallow water, and that of laying a long length of cable in depths of over two miles across an open ocean will be easily recognized, at any rate by the sailor and the engineer. The wires of the Magnetic Telegraph Company had already been carried to various points on the west and south coast of Ireland and in 1852 Mr. F. N. Gisborne, a very able English engineer, obtained an exclusive concession for connecting St. John's, Newfoundland, with Cape Ray in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, by an overhead telegraph line. The idea was to tap steamers coming from London to Cape Race at St. John's, and pass messages between that point and Cape Breton on the other side of the Gulf, by carrier pigeons, a few miles of cables were made in England and laid between Port Edward Island and New Brunswick. Mr. Gisborne then surveyed the route for the land line across Newfoundland, and had erected some forty miles of it when the work was stopped for want of funds. When in New York in 1854, Gisborne was introduced to Mr. Cyrus West Field, a retired merchant, who became enthusiastic on the subject and formed a small but strong syndicate for the practical realization of Gisborne's scheme. A cable eighty-five miles in length was made in England to be laid between Cape Breton and Newfoundland, but after forty miles had been paid out, rough weather ensued, and the undertaking had to be abandoned. A fresh installment was, however, sent out in 1856, and successfully laid across the Gulf thus connecting St. John's with Canada and the American lines. The conductor of this line, instead of being a single solid wire, was for the first time composed of several small wires laid up together in strand form, with a view to avoiding a flaw in any single wire stopping the conductivity, besides affording increased mechanical pliability. The feasibility of uniting two vast systems of telegraphy had engaged the consideration of some of those most prominently associated with electric telegraphy on both sides of the Atlantic. It had been already shown that cables could be successfully laid and maintained in comparatively moderate depths in the Mediterranean, Black Sea, etc., but the nearest points between the British Isles and Newfoundland are nearly 2,000 miles apart. The greatest length of submarine line which had hitherto been effectively submerged, a hundred and ten miles, formed but an insignificant portion of such an enormous distance, and that too involving a depth of nearly three miles for a large proportion of the way, instead of about three hundred fathoms. Apart from the engineering difficulties entailed by this vast distance and depth, the question was then undetermined as to the possibility of conveying electric currents through such a length in an unbroken circuit, and at a speed that would enable messages to be passed rapidly enough in succession to prove remunerative. Various researches had been made, by Faraday among others, with a view to determining the law in relation to the velocity of electricity through a conducting wire. The retarding effect of the insulating covering had already been discovered, 
but the exact formula for the working speed of cables of definite proportions and lengths was not correctly arrived at till some years later the similarity in principle of a cable to a laden jar was first pointed out by mr edward brailsford bright in the course of a paper read before the british association in eighteen fifty four he showed that on charging a gutta-percha covered wire the insulating material tended to absorb and retain a part of the charge and to hold back as a static charge some of the electricity flowing as current through the conductor just as the charge of opposite potential induced on the outside plate of a laden jar statically holds the primary charge on the inner plate until either are neutralized the brothers edward and charles bright made a series of extensive experiments on long lengths of underground wires and these investigations were supplemented later by mr edward orange wildman whitehouse formerly a medical practitioner who became electrician to the first Atlantic cable. Mr. Whitehouse was a man of very high intellectual and scientific attainments, and a most ingenious and painstaking experimenter. The retardation of electric current through an insulated wire due to induction, a phenomenon practically unknown with bare aerial wires suspended on posts, and of no consequence with quite short cables, was overcome by using a succession of opposite currents by this means the latter or retarded portion of each current was wiped out by the opposite current immediately following it and thus a series of electric waves could be made to traverse the cable one after the other several being in the act of passing onward at different points along the conductor at the same time the Messrs. Bright devised a special key for signaling through long cables, embodied with a patent for transmitting these alternating currents from the battery, and this was followed by others to effect the same object, one by Professor Thompson, now Lord Kelvin, who became electrical adviser to the enterprise. A certain degree of knowledge regarding the nature of the bed of the Atlantic Ocean was now available, for in the summer of 1856 a series of soundings had been taken by Lieutenant O. H. Berryman, U.S.N., from U.S.N. Arctic, and also independently by Commander Joseph Damon, R.N., H.M.S. Cyclops, showing what was called a gently undulating plateau, extending the whole distance between Ireland and British North America. These depths, averaging about two and a half miles, compared favorably with those that had presented themselves farther southward. The ground was found to shoal gradually on the Newfoundland side, but rose more rapidly toward the Irish shore. The soundings were taken with the ingenious apparatus of Lt. J. M. Brook, U.S.N., which formed the prototype of all similar deep-sea sounding tubes of the present day. In this, at the extremity of the sounding line, a light iron rod, hollowed at its lower end, passed loosely through a hole in the center of a cannonball weight, which is fastened to the line by a couple of links. On the bottom being touched, the links reverse position, owing to the weight being taken off, and the cannonball or plummet being set free remains on the ground, leaving the tube only to be drawn up with the line. In the act of grounding, however, the open end of the tube presses into the bottom, a specimen of which is consequently obtained, unless it be rock or coral. An oozy bottom was found throughout the soundings. The specimens brought up to the surface were shown under the microscope to consist of the tiny shells of animalculae, the indestructible outside skeletons of the animal organisms known as diatomaceae and globigerinae foraminiferae, largely composed of carbonate of lime. No sand or gravel was found on the ocean bed, from which it was deduced that no currents or other disturbing elements existed at those depths, for otherwise these frail shells would have been rubbed to pieces. As it was, they came up entire without a sign of abrasion. The plateau or ridge, which was found to extend for some four hundred miles in breadth, was considered a veritable feather bed for a cable. Indeed, in his subsequent report to the United States Navy, 
Lieutenant M. F. Morey, USN, spoke of this shallow platform or tableland as having been apparently placed for the express purpose of holding the wires of a submarine telegraph and of keeping them out of harm's way. Lieutenant Morey concluded his report as follows. I do not, however, pretend to consider the question as to the possibility of finding a time calm enough, the sea smooth enough, a wire long enough, or a ship big enough, to lay a coil of wire sixteen hundred miles in length. These words form amusing reading nowadays, as do also the suggestions of telegraph plateaus furnished by Providence as a resting place for the Atlantic cable. The plateau idea was true only to the extent that the bed of the ocean in these regions afforded a smooth surface as compared to the alpine character prevailing north and south of it. These soundings, at something like fifty-mile intervals, were not, however, originally undertaken with the Atlantic cable expressly in view. Indeed, for many years, until experience pointed to the absolute necessity, no special surveys were made previous to the laying of a cable. Formation of the Atlantic Telegraph Company, 1856 Cyrus Field, besides being a man of sanguine temperament and intense business energy, also possessed shrewdness and foresight. Thus he immediately recognized the value of Gisborne's concessions, and determined to turn them to the fullest account. His extraordinary acumen told him that by improving on the exclusive landing rights already obtained in America, he would place himself in the strongest possible position in regard to the big notion of an Atlantic cable. No sooner had he made up his mind to this effect than he set to work to accomplish the idea, and very soon exclusive rights were obtained in his name for practically every important point in connection with the landing of an Atlantic cable on British North American territory, Gisborne having entirely dropped out of the negotiations. The period for these rights was fifty years, besides which he obtained various grants of land, Thus it will be seen he had assured himself a very strong position in connection with any project for an Atlantic cable, without having had, in the words of his brother Henry Field, any experience in the business of laying a submarine telegraph. Mr. Field's syndicate was about this time registered as the New York, Newfoundland, and London Telegraph Company, which was now capable of debarring competition for a considerable period at any rate. Armed with this apparent monopoly, Mr. Field went over to England, empowered by his associates to deal with the exclusive concession possessed by the above company for the coast of Newfoundland and other rights in Nova Scotia, etc. He had already been over before in connection with the Gulf of St. Lawrence cable. He had on that occasion met Mr. John Watkins Brett, who thereupon interested himself financially in the Newfoundland company. On his second mission, in July 1856, he at once put himself into communication with Mr., afterwards Sir, Charles Bright, who was known to be already making various preparations with a view to an Atlantic cable in connection with the magnetic telegraph system. On September 26, 1856, an agreement was entered into between Brett, Bright, and Field in the following terms their signatures being reproduced as they appear at the foot of the document. Mutually and on equal terms, we engage to exert ourselves for the purpose of forming a company for establishing and working of electric telegraphic communication between Newfoundland and Ireland, such company to be called the Atlantic Telegraph Company, or by such other name as the parties hereto shall jointly agree upon. John Watkins Brett, Projector, Charles Tiltson Bright, Projector and Engineer, Cyrus Westfield, Projector. Let us now see what the united efforts of these three projectors had before them. The ground had already been to some extent cleared by their individual exertions when working independently, as well as in other ways. Bright, and also White House, had already proved the feasibility of signaling through such a length of insulated wire as that involved in an Atlantic line. The soundings that had been recently taken showed that the depth was only unfavorable in the sense of being something far, 
but uniformly greater than that in which any cable had previously been submerged finally the favorable nature of the landing rights secured by field on the other side went a long way toward insuring against competition apart from the actual permission there yet remained then the necessity of obtaining a government recognition and if possible government subsidies and b the confidence and pecuniary support of the moneyed mercantile class besides which a suitable form of cable had to be designed and manufactured as well as all the necessary apparatus for the laying of the same as a result of considerable discussion the two governments concerned eventually came to recognize the importance and feasibility of this undertaking for linking together the two great english-speaking nations and the benefits it would confer upon humanity both the british and united states governments gave a subsidy in return for free transmission of their messages with priority over others this however only jointly amounted to eight per cent of the capital and was payable only while the cable worked the atlantic telegraph company was registered on october twentieth eighteen fifty six and the three hundred fifty pounds decided on as the necessary capital for the work was then sought and obtained in an absolutely unprecedented fashion there was no promotion money no prospectus was published no advertisements no brokers and no commissions neither was there at that time any board of directors or executive officers the election of a board was reserved for a meeting of the shareholders to be held after allotment by the provisional committee consisting of the subscribers to the memorandum of association any remuneration to the projectors was left wholly dependent on and subsequent to the shareholders profits being over ten per cent per annum after which the projectors were to divide the surplus the campaign was opened in liverpool the headquarters of the magnetic company the greater proportion of whose shareholders were business men merchants and ship owners mainly hailing from liverpool manchester glasgow and london who appreciated the value of america being connected telegraphically with great britain and europe through their irish lines the first meeting of the atlantic company was convened for november twelfth eighteen fifty six at the underwriters rooms in the liverpool exchange this was called together by means of a small circular on a half sheet of note paper issued by mr e b bright manager of the magnetic company the result was a crowded gathering composed of the wealth enterprise and influence of liverpool and other important business and manufacturing centres similar meetings were also held in manchester and glasgow and a public subscription list was opened at the magnetic company's office of each town in the course of a few days the entire capital was raised by the issue of three hundred and fifty shares of one thousand pounds each chiefly taken up by the shareholders of the magnetic company mr cyrus field had reserved seventy five thousand pounds for american subscription for which he signed but his confidence in his compatriots turned out to be greatly misplaced the result has been thus recounted by his brother he cyrus field thought that one-fourth of the stock should be held in this country the united states and he did not doubt from the eagerness with which three-fourths had been taken in england that the remainder would at once be subscribed in america in point of fact it was only after much trouble that subscribers were obtained in the states for a total of twenty-seven shares or less than one-twelfth of the total capital thus notwithstanding their professed enthusiasm the faith of the americans in the project proved to be strictly limited at any rate they did not rise to the occasion indeed the undertaking was very much an affair of the magnetic telegraph company the officers of which led the shareholders to take a lively interest from the first in the atlantic project as forming the nucleus of a great extension of their business the first meeting of shareholders took place on december ninth eighteen fifty six when a board of directors was elected this included the late george peabody samuel gurney t h brooking t a hankey c m afterwards sir curtis lampson and sir william brown of liverpool 
no less than nine representing the interests of different towns being also directors of the magnetic company including mr j w brett the first chairman was sir william brown subsequently succeeded by the right honorable james stuart wortley m p two names may be further specifically referred to as destined in different ways to have the greatest possible influence in the subsequent development of submarine telegraphy mr afterward sir john pender who was then a magnetic director afterward took a leading part in the vast extensions that have followed to the mediterranean india china australasia the cape and brazil besides several of the subsequent atlantic lines up to the time of his death he was chairman of something like a dozen more or less allied cable companies representing some thirty million pounds of capital and mainly organized through his foresight and business ability then again professor william thompson of glasgow university was a tower of scientific strength on the board he had been from the outset an ardent believer in the atlantic line his acquisition as a director was destined to prove of vast importance in influencing the development of transoceanic communication for his subsequent experiments on the cable during eighteen fifty seven fifty eight led up to his invention of the mirror galvanometer and signaling instrument whereby the most attenuated currents of electricity which are incapable of producing visible signals on other telegraphic apparatus are so magnified by the use of a reflected beam of light as to afford signals readily legible a full description of this invention will be found in its proper place further on mr afterwards sir charles bright was appointed engineer-in-chief with mr wildman whitehouse who had become closely associated with the project as electrician while mr cyrus field became general manager it must not be supposed that because the capital was raised without any great difficulty or because the project had far-seeing supporters that there was any lack of croakers on the contrary the prejudice against the line as a mad scheme ran perhaps even higher than is the case of most great and novel undertakings the critics were many and with our present knowledge it is difficult to recognize that many of the assertions and suggestions emanated from men of science as well as from eminent engineers and sailors who we should say nowadays ought to have known better for example the late professor sir g b airy f r s astronomer royal announced to the world one that it was a mathematical impossibility to submerge a cable in safety at so great a depth and two that if it were possible no signals could be transmitted through so great a length from the very outset of the project the engineer-in-chief as soon as appointed had to deal with wild and undeveloped criticisms and suggestions partly from inventors who desired to reap personal benefit by the scheme and amateurs in the art generally all of which appear singularly ludicrous nowadays the fallacy most frequently introduced was perhaps that the cable would be suspended in the water at a certain depth naturally the pressure increases with the depth on all sides of a cable or anything else in its descent through the sea but as practically everything on earth is more compressible than water it is obvious that the iron wire yarn gutta percha and copper conductor forming the cable must be more and more compressed as they descend thus the cable constantly increases its density or specific gravity in going down while the equal bulk of the water surrounding it continues to have practically speaking very nearly the same specific gravity as at the surface without this valuable property of water the hydraulic press would not exist the strange blunder here described was participated in by some of the most distinguished naval men as an instance even at a comparatively recent period captain marriott r n the famous nautical author writes of the sea what a mine of wealth must lie buried in its sands what riches lie entangled among its rocks or remain suspended in its unfathomable gulf 
where the compressed fluid is equal in gravity to that which it encircles to obviate this non-existent difficulty it was gravely proposed to festoon the cable across at a given maximum depth between buoys and floats or even parachutes at which ships might call hook on and talk telegraphically to shore others again proposed to apply gummed cotton to the outside of the cable in connection with the above burying system the idea was that the gum or glue would gradually dissolve and so let the cable down quietly as an example of the crude notions prevailing in the mind of one gentleman with a proposed invention to whom was shown an inch specimen of the cable he remarked now i understand how you stow it away on board you cut it up into bits beforehand and then join up the pieces as you lay some again absolutely went so far as to take out patents for converting the laying vessel into a huge factory with a view to making the cable on board in one continuous length and submerging it during the process finally one naval expert assured the company that no other machinery for paying out was necessary than a handspike to stop the egress of the cable end of chapter 1 recording by maria casper chapter 2 of the story of the atlantic cable this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the story of the atlantic cable by sir charles bright chapter 2 the manufacture of the line the construction of the cable was taken in hand the following february eighteen fifty seven the distance from valentia on the western irish coast to trinity bay newfoundland the two landing points selected being one thousand six hundred forty nautical miles it was estimated that a length of two thousand five hundred n m would be sufficient to meet all requirements this would provide sufficient margin for a considerable amount of slack cable for accommodating the irregularities of the bottom the gutta percha company of london was entrusted with the manufacture of the core consisting of a strand of eleven number twenty two b w g copper wires total diameter number fourteen gauge weighing one hundred seven pounds per n m insulated with three coatings of gutta percha to three-eighths inch diameter weighing two hundred sixty one pounds per n m the conductor being in fact covered to number zero zero b w g this formed a far heavier core than had been previously adopted and on this account the difficulties of manufacture were proportionately increased the enormous pressure of the ocean at such depths involved also a much severer test for the core on the other hand as we now know the conductor and consequently also the insulator should have been still larger to a material degree the engineer of the line strongly urged a conductor weighing three hundred ninety two pounds per n m with the same weight for the insulator but his fellow projectors the business element of the undertaking were all for getting the work done while the weather permitted that year and they were perhaps over quick to recognize the difference in the capital required moreover they were here supported technically by the views of the responsible electrician as well as by such high authorities as michael faraday and morse the latter reported that large coated wires used beneath the water or the earth are worse conductors so far as velocity of transmission is concerned than small ones and therefore are not so well suited as small ones for the purpose of submarine transmission of telegraphic signals faraday had stated the larger the wire the more electricity was required to charge it and the greater was the retardation of that electric impulse which should be occupied in sending that charge forward thus it will be seen that although faraday laid the foundations of a large proportion of the electrical engineering of today, his views in this instance did not prove to be correct the theoretical resemblance of a cable to a leyden jar in reference to the effect of charging either 
seems to have been uh, prominently in mind without proper regard to the resistance offered by the wire to the electric current, a resistance which becomes less the greater the bulk of the wire. Besides the engineer being overridden in this matter, the word of the electrical adviser on the board, Professor Thompson, regarding the carrying capacity or working speed that would be obtained with such a core as that decided on, in view of the length involved, was also unavailing. While no one can fail to appreciate the business-like manner in which this undertaking was pushed through from the moment of inception, comparing only too favorably with some experiences of today, it was, without doubt, a vast pity that more time was not devoted to a fuller consideration of some of the problems, such as that involved over the dimensions of the conductor and insulator. No serious fault could, however, be detected with its actual manufacture, though the methods of those days were primitive as compared with present practice, and a system of efficient electrical testing altogether wanting. After various experiments had been made with sample lengths of different iron wires made up into cable, the contract for the outer sheathings was, in order to get through the work quickly, divided equally between Messrs. Glass, Elliott and Company of Greenwich and Messrs. R. S. Newell and Company of Birkenhead, both originally pit rope makers. The insulated core was first surrounded with a serving of hemp saturated with a mixture of tar, pitch, linseed oil, and wax, and then sheathed spirally with an armor of eighteen strands, each containing seven iron wires of number 22 BWG, the completed strand being number 14 gauge in diameter. The cable was then finally drawn through another mixture of tar. Its weight in air was one ton per nm, and in water only 13.4 hundred weight, bearing a strain of three tons five hundred weight before breaking, equivalent to nearly five miles of its weight in water. For each end approaching the shore, the sheathing consisted of twelve wires of number zero gauge, making a total weight of about nine tons to the mile. This type was adopted for the first ten miles from the Irish coast, and for fifteen miles from the landing at Newfoundland, at both of which localities rocks had been found to abound plentifully, so much so that the armor was insufficient, and present practice provides double the weight under similar conditions. Only four months was allowed for the manufacture of this 2,500 miles of cable, which had to be delivered in June of that year, 1857. This involved the preparation and drawing of 20,500 miles of copper wire, providing for the lay, and stranding into the 2,500 miles of conductor. For the insulation, nearly 300 tons of gutta-percha required to be prepared, and the three separate layers of gutta-percha required to be applied to the wire, subsequently followed by the spiral serving of yarn. Finally, and with a due allowance for lay, 367,500 miles of wire had to be drawn from 1,687 tons of charcoal iron and laid up into 50,000 miles of strand for the outer sheathing. The entire length of copper and iron wire employed was therefore 340,500 miles, enough to engirdle the earth thirteen times, and considerably more than enough to extend from the earth to the moon. The work was enormously increased, of course, on account of the sheathing being composed of a number of strands instead of several single wires. While having certain mechanical advantages at the outset, this stranded sheathing is not a durable type of cable besides being somewhat costly, and is never adopted nowadays. The contract price for the entire cable was £225,000, the core costing £40 and the armor £50 per mile. As fast as the cable was made at the respective factories, it was coiled into iron tanks ready for shipment. Ships and Paying Out Machinery The Race Against Time resulting from an unfortunate arrangement with American interests, was truly appalling, for, besides the manufacture of the line itself, ships had to be selected and prepared for receiving the cable, and machinery for paying out the line had to be designed and made. So far as the manufacture went, the machinery for that was already in existence, in view of the cables that had previously been laid.
apart from the fact that the sheathing machinery was practically the same as had already been used for making ropes with. But this being the first ocean line, special apparatus had to be worked out for submerging a cable satisfactorily in deep water. So far as ships were concerned, the British and United States governments had already expressed willingness to furnish these. The former undertaking took shape by the Admiralty placing HMS Agamemnon, a screw-propelled line of battleship and one of the finest in the British Navy, at the company's disposal for the expedition. She had been Admiral Lyon's flagship during the bombardment of Sebastopol a couple of years before, but in her coming mission was to do more to bring about the reign of peace by drawing together in closer commune the several nations of the earth than any man-of-war was ever called to do before or after with a somewhat peculiar construction she was admirably adapted for her work her engines were quite near the stern while amidships she had a magnificent hold forty-five feet square and about twenty feet deep in this capacious receptacle nearly half the cable was stowed from the works at greenwich the American government sent over the largest and finest ship of their navy, the U.S. frigate Niagara, a screw corvette of 5,200 tons. As a consort, the U.S. paddle frigate Susquehanna was also detailed for the expedition, while H.M.S. Leopard and H.M. sounding vessel Cyclops were similarly provided by the British government. The latter was to precede the fleet, nicknamed the Wire Squadron, to show the way. The paying-out apparatus for the two laying vessels, HMS Agamemnon and USNS Niagara, had to be somewhat hurriedly put together. Consequently, not as much attention was paid to its design as the novelty of the undertaking really demanded. The previous and somewhat primitive gear hitherto used had proved to possess too little strength, the cable, when being laid in anything but quite shallow water, having more than once obtained the mastery through meeting insufficient restraining force. In the new machine there was certainly no lack of holding back power. It erred indeed the other way, being so heavy and powerful that it was liable to break the cable under any material strain. The degree of retardation was regulated by a hand wheel actuating a frame clutch surrounding the outside of a brake wheel. The details of this machine were worked out by Messrs. C. de Berg and Company, the manufacturers. The engineer-in-chief also furnished external guards to the propelling screws of each laying vessel to prevent a foul with the cable in the case of going astern. This cage was nicknamed a crinoline, then in fashion with ladies, which indeed it somewhat resembled. The above screw guard may be seen in several of the illustrations of either ships further on. Were it not for the necessity of sounding operations, it would be applied to all telegraph ships today preparations for starting. By the third week in July, within the course of as many weeks, the great ships had absorbed all their precious cargo, the Agamemnon in the Thames and the Niagara in the Mersey. Staff. For such an undertaking the staff had, of course, to be considerable. Besides the engineer-in-chief, Mr. Bright, the engineering department was composed as follows, Mr. afterward Sir Samuel Canning formerly a railway engineer, who had laid the Gulf of St. Lawrence and other cables, Mr. William Henry Woodhouse, who had laid some of the cables in the Mediterranean, Mr. F. C. Webb, with much experience in early cable work, and finally Mr. Henry Clifford, a mechanical engineer destined to be responsibly associated with a large proportion of the cables since laid. Besides Mr. Whitehouse, whose health, however, did not permit him to accompany the expedition, there were on the electrical staff Mr. C. V. de Sauti, Mr. J. C. Laws, Mr. F. Lambert, Mr. H. A. C. Saunders, Mr. Benjamin Smith, Mr. Richard Collett, and Mr. Charles Gerardi, all of whom were afterward prominently connected with subsequent submarine cable undertakings. Their respective energies were divided up between the two laying ships. The expedition was to be further strengthened by a representative of the Times, as well of the Daily News and New York Herald. On the vessels being fully loaded, ready for the start, send-off festivities occurred, in which all classes of those engaged on the work took part. The Times recounted the function on board the Agamemnon as follows. The three central tables were occupied by the crew of the Agamemnon, a fine active body of men, 
who paid the greatest attention to the speeches and drank all the toasts with an admirable punctuality, at least so long as their three pints of beer per man lasted. But we regret to add that with the heat of the day and the enthusiasm of Jack in the cause of science, the mugs were all empty long before the chairman's list of toasts had been gone through. Next in interest to the sailors were the workmen and their wives and babies, all being permitted to assist. The latter, it is true, sometimes squalled at an affecting peroration, but that rather improved the effect than otherwise, and the presence of their little ones only marked the genuine good feeling of the employers, who had thus invited not only their workmen, but their workmen's families to the feast. It was a momentary return to the old patriarchal times. This function having come to an end, the Agamemnon set out for Sheerness. When leaving her moorings, opposite Glass and Elliot's works, the scene was one of considerable interest. It is recorded that many thousands of persons thronged the riverside as far as Greenwich Hospital. In the immediate neighborhood of the factory a salute was fired as the proud vessel moved away, and a deafening cheer was raised by the assembled crowds. The crew of HMS Agamemnon manned the gunnels, and returned the cheer with lusty lungs, while from the stern gallery ladies waved their handkerchiefs, and savants forgot for a while the mysteries of electricity and submarine cable work, as they returned the hearty cheers which reached them from the shore. Similar proceedings took place on board the Niagara, and the two ships met at Queenstown, County Cork, on July 30, 1857. They were moored about three-quarters of a mile apart, and a piece of cable run between the two to enable the entire length of line, 2,500 nm, to be tested and worked through. The result was all that could be desired, and the wire squadron set sail for the rendezvous at Valencia Bay on Monday, August 3rd. Besides the vessels already named, there were H.M. Tender Advice and the steam tug Willing Mind, to assist in landing the cable at Valencia, as well as the U.S. screw steamer Arctic and the paddle steamer Victoria, Newfoundland Telegraph Company, on duty in Trinity Bay, Newfoundland, to await the arrival of the fleet and assist in landing the cable at that end. On arrival in harbor the following day, the ships were hospitably welcomed by His Excellency the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, the Earl of Carlisle, who had journeyed from Dublin Castle for the purpose. A déjeuner banquet was given by the Knight of Kerry, Sir Peter Fitzgerald, the lord of the manor for many miles round, and this little corner of Ireland, the next parish to America, was quite en fête for the occasion. End of chapter 2《ハッピーバースデーファンタジー》これは世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの世界のカーボンの The following day was occupied in landing the massive shore end, which, weighing nearly ten tons to the mile, as already described, was calculated to withstand damage from any anchorage in the bay, besides being proof against disturbance and damage from surf or currents. The landing place, which had been finally selected, was a little cove known as Ballycarberry, about three miles from Carisevan, in Valencia Harbour. The two small assistant steamers, Willing Mind, a tug with a zeal worthy of her name, and advice, ready not merely with advice but most lusty help, with several other launches and boats were employed in the operation, which was thus described in one of the many newspaper reports. Valencia Bay was studded with innumerable small craft decked with the gayest bunting. Small boats flitted hither and thither, their occupants cheering enthusiastically as the work successfully progressed. The cable boats were managed by the sailors of the Niagara and the Susquehanna. It was a well-designed compliment and indicative of the future fraternization of the nations that the shore rope was arranged to be presented on the English side of the Atlantic to the representative of the Queen by the officers and men of the United States Navy, and that on the American side the British officers and sailors should make a similar presentation to the President of the Great Republic. 
From the mainland the operators were watched with intense interest. For several hours the Lord Lieutenant stood on the beach, surrounded by his staff and the directors of the railway and telegraph companies, waiting the arrival of the cable. When at length the American sailors jumped through the surge with the hawser to which it was attached, His Excellency was among the first to lay hold of it and pull it lustily to the shore. Indeed, every one present seemed desirous of having a hand in the great work. At half-past seven that evening, August 5, 1857, the cable was hauled on shore at Ballycarberry Strand, and formal presentation was made of it by the officer in command of the Niagara to the Lord Lieutenant, His Excellency expressing a hope that the work so well begun would be carried to a satisfactory completion. The vicar of the parish then offered a prayer for the success of the undertaking. The work connected with the landing of the shore end was not actually completed till sunset, so as it was too late then to set out and start cable laying, the ships remained at anchor in the bay till daybreak. That night there was a grand ball in the little village of Kingstown, and the day dawn caught the merrymakers still engaged in their festivities. Laying the First Ocean Cable, 1857 Owing to the fact that the cable had had to be divided between two ships, it was obvious that a mid-ocean splice between the two lengths was involved. The engineer-in-chief, Mr. Bright, was anxious both ships should start laying toward their respective shores from mid-ocean, as by that plan favorable weather for the splice could be waited for, besides having the time occupied in laying the line, thereby reducing chances of bad weather experience and getting over the most difficult deep-water part of the work first. The electricians, however, made much of the importance of being in continuous communication with shore during laying operations, and this view appealed to the board partly, no doubt, on account of the novelty of being able from headquarters to speak to a ship as she proceeded across the Atlantic. It had therefore been arranged for the laying of the cable to be started by the Niagara from the Irish coast, the Agamemnon laying the remaining half from mid-ocean. The ships got under way at an early hour on the morning following the landing of the shore end. Paying out commenced from the Niagara's forepart, and as the distance from there to the stern was considerable, A number of men were stationed at intervals, like sentries, to see that every foot of the line reached its destination in safety. The machinery did not seem at first to take kindly to its work, giving vent to many ominous groans. After five miles had been disgorged, the line caught in some of the apparatus and parted. The good ship at once put back, and the cable was underrun by the willing mind, with boats, the whole distance from the shore a tedious and hard task, as may be imagined. At length the end was lifted out of the water and spliced to the coil on board, and as the bight of the cable dropped safely to the bottom of the sea, the mighty ship steamed ahead once more. At first she moved very slowly, not more than two miles an hour, to avoid the danger of another accident, but the feeling that they were at last away was in itself a relief. The ships were all in sight, and so near that they could hear each other's bells. The Niagara, as if knowing she was bound for the land out of whose forest she came, bowed her head proudly to the waves. Slowly passed the hours of that day, in Mr. Henry Field's words, but all went well and the ships were moving out into the broad Atlantic. At length the sun went down in the west and stars came out on the face of the deep, but no man slept. A thousand eyes were watching a great experiment, including those who had a personal interest in the issue. All through that night and through the anxious days and nights that followed, there was a feeling in the heart of every soul on board as if some dear friend were at the turning point of death, and they were watching beside him. There was a strange, unnatural silence in the ship. Men paced the deck with soft and muffled tread, speaking only in whispers, as if a loud or heavy footfall might snap the vital cord. So much had they grown to feel for the enterprise, that the cable seemed to them like a human creature, on whose fate they themselves hung, as if it were to decide their own destiny. There are some who will never forget that first night at sea. Perhaps the reaction from the excitement on shore made the impression the deeper. There are moments in life when everything comes back to us. 
what memories cropped up in those long night hours how many on board that ship as they stood on the deck and watched the mysterious cord disappearing in the darkness thought of homes beyond the sea of absent ones of the distance and of the dead but no musings turned them from the work in hand there were vigilant eyes on deck mr bright the engineer-in-chief was there also in turn mr woodhouse and mr canning his chief assistants the paying out machinery did its work and though it made a constant rumble in the ship that dull heavy sound was music in their ears as it told them that all was well if one should drop asleep and wake up at night he had only to hear the sound of the old coffee mill and his fears being relieved he would go to sleep again the next day was a day of beautiful weather the ships were getting farther away from land and began to steam ahead at the rate of four and five knots the cable was paid out at a speed a little faster than the ship to allow for inequalities of surface on the bottom of the sea while it was thus going overboard communication was kept up constantly with the land partly by what are known as continuity signals i e electrical signals at definite time intervals from ship to shore as a test of the continuity of the line to quote mr field again every moment the current was passing between ship and shore the communication was as perfect as between liverpool and london or boston and new york not only did the electricians telegraph back to valentia the progress they were making but the officers on board sent messages to their friends in america to go out by the steamers from liverpool the heavens seemed to smile on them that day the coils came up from below the deck without a kink and unwinding themselves easily passed over the stern into the sea all sunday ninth instant the same favoring fortune continued and when the officers who could be spared from the deck met in the cabin and captain hudson read the service it was with subdued voices and grateful hearts that they responded to the prayers to him who spreadeth out the heavens and ruleth the raging of the sea on monday tenth they were over two hundred miles at sea they had got far beyond the shallow waters off the coast they had passed over the submarine mountain that figures on the charts of damon and berryman and where mr bright's log gives a descent from five hundred and fifty to one thousand seven hundred and fifty fathoms within eight miles then they came to the deeper waters of the atlantic where the cable sank to the awful depths of two thousand fathoms still the iron cord buried itself in the waves and every instant the flash of light in the darkened telegraph room told of the passage of the electric current everything went well till three forty five p m on the fourth day out tuesday august eleventh when the cable snapped after three hundred and eighty miles had been laid owing to mismanagement on the part of the mechanic at the brakes thus the familiar thin line which had been streaming out from the niagara for six days was no longer to be seen by the accompanying vessels one who was present wrote the unbidden tear started to many a manly eye the interest taken in the enterprise by officers and men alike exceeded anything ever seen and there is no wonder that there should have been so much emotion on the occasion of the accident the following report from bright gives the details of the expedition up to the time of this regrettable occurrence report to the directors of the atlantic telegraph company august eighteen fifty seven after leaving valentia on the evening of the seventh instant the paying out of the cable from the niagara progressed most satisfactorily until immediately before the mishap at the junction between the shore and the smaller cable about eight miles from the starting point it was necessary to stop to renew the splice this was successfully effected and the end of the heavier cable lowered by a hawser until it reached the bottom two buoys being attached at a short distance apart to mark the place of union by noon of the eighth we had paid out forty miles of cable including the heavy shore end our exact position at that time was in latitude fifty degrees fifty nine minutes thirty six seconds north longitude eleven degrees nineteen minutes fifteen seconds west and the depth of the water according to the soundings taken by the cyclops whose course we nearly followed ninety fathoms 
Up to 4 p.m. on that day the egress of the cable had been regulated by the power necessary to keep the machinery in motion at a slightly higher rate than that of the ship, but as the water deepened it was necessary to place some further restraint upon the cable by applying pressure to the friction drums in connection with the paying-out sheaves. By midnight eighty-five miles had been safely laid, the depth of the water being then a little more than two hundred fathoms. At eight o'clock on the morning of the ninth, we had exhausted the deck coil in the after part of the ship, having paid out one hundred twenty miles. The change to the coil between decks forward was safely made. By noon we had laid one hundred thirty-six miles of cable, the Niagara having reached latitude fifty-two degrees, eleven minutes, forty seconds, north, longitude thirteen degrees, zero minutes, twenty seconds, west, and the depth of the water having increased to four hundred ten fathoms. In the evening the speed of the vessel was raised to five knots. I had previously kept down the rate at from three to four knots for the small cable, and two for the heavy end next the shore, wishing to get the men and machinery well at work prior to attaining the speed which I had intended making. By midnight, one hundred eighty-nine miles of cable had been laid. At four o'clock on the morning of the tenth, the depth began to increase rapidly from 550 to 1,750 fathoms in a distance of eight miles. Up to this time a strain of 700 weight sufficed to keep the rate of the cable near enough to that of the ship, but as the water deepened the proportionate speed of the cable advanced, and it was necessary to augment the pressure by degrees until at a depth of 1,700 fathoms the indicator showed a strain of 1,500 weight while the cable and the ship were running five and a half and five knots, respectively. By noon on the 10th we had paid out 255 miles of cable, the vessel having made 214 miles from the shore, being then in latitude 52 degrees 27 minutes 50 seconds north, longitude 16 degrees 15 minutes west. At this time we experienced an increasing swell, followed later in the day by a strong breeze. From this period, having reached two thousand fathoms of water, it was necessary to increase the strain by a ton, by which the rate of the cable was maintained in the due proportion to that of the ship. At six o'clock in the evening some difficulty arose through the cable getting out of the sheaves of the paying-out machine, owing to the pitch and tar hardening in the groove, and a splice of large dimensions passing over them. This was rectified by fixing additional guards and softening the tar with oil. It was necessary to bring up the ship, holding the cable by stoppers, until it was again properly disposed around the pulleys. Some importance is due to this event, as showing that it is possible to lay two in deep water without continuing to pay out the cable, a point upon which doubts have frequently been expressed. Shortly after this the speed of the cable gained considerably on that of the ship, and up to nine o'clock, while the rate of the latter was about three knots by the log, the cable was running out from five and a half to five and three-quarter knots. The strain was then raised to twenty-five hundred weight, but the wind and the sea increasing, and a current at the same time carrying the cable at an angle from the direct line of the ship's course, it was found insufficient to check the cable, which was at midnight making two and a half knots above the speed of the ship, and sometimes imperiling the safe uncoiling in the hold. The retarding force was therefore increased at two o'clock to an amount equivalent to thirty hundredweight, and then again, in consequence of the speed continuing to be more than it would be prudent to permit, to thirty-five hundredweight. By this the rate of the cable was brought to a little short of five knots, at which it continued steadily until three forty-five a.m., when it parted, the length paid out at the time being three hundred eighty miles. I had up to this attended personally to the regulation of the brakes, but finding that all was going on well, and it being necessary that I should be temporarily away from the machine, to ascertain the rate of the ship, to see how the cable was coming out of the hold, and also to visit the electrician's room, the machine was for the moment left in charge of a mechanic who had been engaged from the first in its construction and fitting, and was acquainted with its operation. In proceeding toward the fore part of the ship I heard the machine stop. I immediately called out to relieve the brakes, but when I reached the spot the cable was broken. On examining the machine, which was otherwise in perfect order, I found that the brakes had not been released, 
and to this, or to the hand-wheel of the brake being turned the wrong way, may be attributed the stoppage and consequent fracture of the cable. When the rate of the wheels grew slower, as the ship dropped her stern in the swell, the brake should have been eased. This had been done regularly, whenever an unusually sudden descent of the ship temporarily withdrew the pressure from the cable in the sea. But owing to our entering the deep water the previous morning, and having all hands ready for any emergency that might occur there, the chief part of my staff had been compelled to give in at night through sheer exhaustion, and thence, being short-handed, I was obliged for the time to leave the machine without, as it proved, sufficient intelligence to control it. I perceive that on the next occasion it will be needful, from the wearing and anxious nature of the work, to have three separate relays of staff, and to employ for attention to the brakes a higher degree of mechanical skill. The origin of the accident was no doubt the amount of retarding strain put upon the cable, but had the machine been properly manipulated at the time, it could not possibly have taken place. For three days, in shallow and deep water, as well as in rapid transitions from one to the other, nothing could be more perfect than the working of the cable machinery. It had been made extra heavy, with a view to recovery work. It, however, performed its duty so smoothly and efficiently in the smaller depths, where the weight of the cable had less ability to overcome its friction and resistance, that it can scarcely be said to be too heavy for paying out in deep water, where it was necessary, from the increased weight of the cable, to restrain its rapid motion, by applying to it a considerable degree of additional friction. Its action was most complete, and all parts worked well together. I see how the gear can be improved by a modification in the form of sheave, by an addition to the arrangement for adjusting the brakes, and some other alterations, but with proper management, without any change whatever. I am confident that the whole length of cable might have been safely laid by it and it must be remembered, as a test of the work which it has done, that, unfortunate as this termination to the expedition is, the longest depth of cable ever laid has been paid out by it, and that in the deepest water yet passed over. After the accident had occurred, soundings were taken by Lieutenant Dayman from the Cyclops, and the depth found to be two thousand fathoms. It will be remembered that some importance was attached to the cable on board the Niagara and Agamemnon being manufactured in opposite lays. I thought this a favorable opportunity to show that practically the difference was not of consequence in effecting the junction in mid-ocean. We therefore made a splice between the two vessels. This was then lowered in a heavy sea after which several miles were paid out without difficulty. I requested the commanders of the several vessels to proceed to Plymouth as the docks there afford better facilities than any other port for landing the cable, should it be necessary to do so. The whole of the cable remaining on board has been carefully tested and inspected, and found to be in as perfect condition as when it left the works at Greenwich and Birkenhead, respectively. One important point presses for your consideration at an early period. A large portion of cable already laid may be recovered at a comparatively small expense. I append an estimate of the cost, and shall be glad to receive your authority to proceed with this work. I do not perceive in our present position any reason for discouragement, but I have on the contrary a greater confidence than ever in the undertaking. It has been proved beyond a doubt that no obstacle exists to prevent our ultimate success, and I see clearly how every difficulty which has presented itself in this voyage can be effectually dealt with in the next. The cable has been laid at the expected rate in the great depths. Its electric working through the entire length has been satisfactorily accomplished, while the portion laid actually improved in efficiency by being submerged from the low temperature of the water and the increased close texture of gutta percha thereby effected. Mechanically speaking, the structure of the cable has answered every expectation that I had formed of it. Its weight in water is so adjusted to the depth that strain is within a manageable scope, while the effects of the undercurrents upon its surface prove how dangerous it would be to lay a much lighter rope, which would, by the greater time occupied in sinking, expose an increased surface to their power, besides its descent being at an angle such as would not provide for good laying at the bottom. On the other hand, in regard to any further length made, 
I would take this opportunity of again strongly urging the desirability of a much larger conductor and corresponding increase in the weight of insulation, in accordance with my original recommendation. I have the honor to remain, gentlemen, yours very faithfully, Charles T. Bright, Engineer-in-Chief, to the Directors of the Atlantic Telegraph Company. End of Chapter 3《Chapter Four of the Story of the Atlantic Cable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright. Chapter Four Preparations for Another Attempt. This untoward interruption to the expedition was naturally a cause of great disappointment to all connected with the undertaking, for there was not enough cable left to complete the work, nor was there time to get more made and stowed on board, to renew the attempt before the season would be too far advanced. The squadron proceeded to Plymouth to unload the cable into tanks at Keyham, now Devonport, dockyard, chiefly because some of the ships— could not be spared by their respective governments till the following year. In the middle of October 1857, the engineer-in-chief proceeded to Valencia in a small paddle-steamer with the object of picking up some of the lost line from this end. After experiencing a series of gales, over fifty miles of the main cable were recovered, and the shore end buoyed, ready for splicing onto in the coming year. The first expedition had opened the eyes of the investing public to the vastness of the undertaking, and led many to doubt who did not doubt before. Some began to look upon it as a romantic adventure of the sea, rather than as a serious commercial undertaking. This decline of popular faith was felt as soon as there was a call for more money. The loss of 335 miles of cable with the postponement of the expedition to another year, was equivalent to a loss of a hundred thousand pounds. To make the above sum good, the capital of the company had to be increased, and this new capital was not so readily obtainable. The projectors found that it was easy to go with the current of popular enthusiasm, but very hard to stem a growing tide of popular distrust and it must also be remembered that from the very first the section of the public which looked with distrust upon the idea of an atlantic telegraph was far in excess of that which did not indeed the opposition encountered was much on a par with the great popular prejudice which george stephenson had to overcome when projecting his great railway schemes but whatever the depression at the untimely termination of the first expedition, it did not interfere with renewed and vigorous efforts to prepare for a second. In the end, the appeal to the shareholders for more money was responded to, and the directors were enabled to give orders for the manufacture of 700 miles of new cable of the same description, to make up for what had been lost, and to provide a surplus against all contingencies. Thus, 3,000 nautical miles in all were shipped this time, instead of 2,500 miles. New paying-out machinery was devised with a view to obviating the possibility of a recurrence of the accident on the first expedition. In the new apparatus, the brake was so arranged that a lever exercised a uniform holding power, in exact proportion to the weights attached to it, and while capable of being released by a hand-wheel, it could not be tightened. The general idea of this clever appliance had been originally introduced by J. G. Apold in connection with the crank apparatus in jails, and it was now especially adapted to the exigencies of cable-work by the engineer, Mr. Bright, and Mr. C. E. Amos, a member of the famous engineering firm Eastern and Amos, who constructed the entire machinery. 
the great future of the apparatus was that it provided for automatic brake release upon the strain exceeding that intended thus only a maximum agreed strain could be applied this being regulated from time to time by weights according to the depth of water and consequent weight of cable being paid out in passing from the hold to the stern of the laying vessel the cable is taken round a drum or drums figure eighteen gives a general view of the apparatus attached to the axle of the drum is a wheel fitted with an iron friction strap to which are fixed blocks of hard wood capable of exerting a given retarding power varying with the weights hung on to the lever which tightens the strap when the friction becomes great the wheels have an increased tendency to carry the wooden blocks around with them thus the lever bars are deflected from the vertical line and the iron band opened sufficiently to lessen the brake power bright also introduced a dynamometer apparatus for indicating and controlling the strain during paying out a vast improvement on that embodied in the previous machines the working of the entire machine was as follows between the two brake drums and the stern of the vessel the cable was led under the grooved wheel of the dynamometer this wheel had a weight attached to it and could be moved up or down in an iron frame if the strain upon the cable was small the wheel would bend the cable downward and its index would show a low degree of pressure but whenever the strain increased the cable in straightening itself would at once lift the dynamometer wheel with the indicator attached to it which showed the pressure in hundredweights and tons the amount of strain with a given weight upon the wheel was determined by experiments and a hand wheel in connection with the levers of the paying out machine was placed immediately opposite the dynamometer so that directly the indicator showed strain increasing the person in charge could at once by turning the hand wheel lift up the weights that tightened the friction straps and so let the cable run freely through the paying out machine although therefore the strain could be reduced or entirely withdrawn in a moment it could not be increased by the man at the wheel the cable in coming from the tanks passed under the lightly weighted jockey pulley this arrangement while leading the line on to the drums at the same time checked it slightly from here it was guided by a grooved pulley or v-sheave along the tops of both drums then three times round them and hence over another v-sheave and on to the dynamometer from this the cable was led over a second pulley and so into the sea by the stern sheaves this entire apparatus simplified as regards the brake has since been universally adopted for submarine cable work with the exception that a single flanged drum fitted with a sort of plow skid or knife edge to guide or fleet the incoming turn of cable correctly on to the drum is now used in place of the grooved sheave or sheaves as soon as the new machinery was constructed all the engineering staff gathered together for the purpose of thoroughly acquainting themselves with its working mr f c webb having engagements elsewhere had been replaced by mr w e everett u s a who had been chief marine engineer of the niagara mr everett was to have charge of the machinery on the laying vessel while mr woodhouse controlled the cable operations since the manufacture of the cable in eighteen fifty seven professor thompson had become impressed with the conviction that the electric conductivity of copper varied greatly with its degree of purity as a result of the professor's further investigations the extra length of cable made for the coming expedition was subjected to systematic and searching tests for the purity and conductivity of the copper every hank of wire was tested and all whose conducting power fell below a certain value rejected 
here then we have the first instance of an organized system of testing for conductivity at the cable factory a system which has ever since been rigorously insisted on and now in the spring of eighteen fifty eight an invention was perfected that was destined to have a remarkable effect on submarine cable enterprise for professor thompson now lord kelvin devised and perfected the mirror speaking instrument then often described as the marine galvanometer of which it may be fairly said that it entirely revolutionized long distance signaling and electrical testing aboard ship this most ingenious apparatus consists of a small and exceedingly light steel magnet with a tiny reflector or mirror fixed to it both together weighing but a single grain or thereabouts this delicate magnet is suspended from its center by a filament of silk and surrounded by a coil of the thinnest insulated copper wire a very weak current is sufficient to produce a slight though nearly imperceptible movement of the suspended magnet when electricity passes through the surrounding coil a fine ray of light from a shaded lamp behind a screen at a short distance is directed through a slot in the screen thence to the open centre of the coil upon the mirror it is then reflected back to a graduated scale as may be seen from figure twenty one an exceedingly slight angle of motion on the part of the magnet is thus made to magnify the movement of the spot of light upon the scale and to render it so considerable as to be readily noted by the eye of the operating clerk the ray is brought to a focus by passing through a lens by combinations of these movements of the speck of light in length and direction upon the index an alphabet is readily formed the magnet is artificially brought back to zero with great precision after each signal by the earth's magnetism and also both by the natural torsion of the fibre and the controlling action of the adjusting magnet with the help of the thumbscrew for regulation purposes in a word professor thompson's combined mirror telegraph and marine galvanometer transmitted messages by multiplying and magnifying the signals through a cable by the agency of imponderable light it is only to be regretted that the electrician responsible for the subsequent working through operations did not sooner appreciate the great beauties of the above apparatus and the advantage of a small generating force such as it alone required end of chapter four chapter five of the story of the atlantic cable this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the story of the atlantic cable by sir charles bright chapter five the trial trip the engineer-in-chief mr bright arranged that this time an experimental expedition should be first made during which a complete rehearsal was to be gone through of the various operations to be performed during cable manoeuvres these operations were to consist of making splices picking up and buoying besides laying in deep water and exercising all hands in their work generally it was on this occasion also agreed that paying out should start from mid-ocean instead of from either shore it was further arranged that the main cable should be buoyed at each end and the connection to it by the heavy cable from shore effected at the earliest opportunity all the three thousand miles of cable was coiled into the two large ships by the end of may figure twenty two gives a general idea of the paying out apparatus mounted on the deck of the agamemnon and figure twenty three a view in section of the four tanks of the niagara when loaded with her cargo of cable the engineer had this time fitted cast iron cones in the middle of each cable coil to meet the requirements of safe paying out 
besides providing a large margin of space to the hatchway above. Figure 24 shows the loading of the Agamemnon. The rest of the telegraph squadron was on this occasion made up by H. M. Gorgon, H. M. Paddle Steamer Voloris, and H. M. Surveying Steamer Porcupine. The fleet set forth on their second cruise on May 29, 1858, this time without any show of public enthusiasm. Mr. Bright was again assisted by the same engineering staff, but Professor Thompson had agreed to take a more active part in the electrical work. The Bay of Biscay was to be the scene of the experiments, the actual site being about a 120 miles northwest of Karuna, where the Gorgon obtained soundings of 2,530 fathoms, or nearly three statute miles. The Agamemnon and Niagara were then backed close together, stern on, and a strong hawser was passed between them. Each ship had on board some defective cable for the experiments about to be conducted. The proceedings may perhaps best be described by extracts from the engineer's diary. Monday, May 31st, 10 a.m. Hove to latitude 47 degrees 11 minutes, longitude 9 degrees 37 minutes. Up to midday, engaged in making splice between experimental cable in forecoil and that in main hold, besides other minor operations. In afternoon, getting hawser from Niagara and her portion of cable to make joint and splice. 4 p.m. commenced splice. 5.15, splice completed. 5.25, let go, splice frame. Weight, three hundredweight. Over gangway, amidships, starboard side. 5.30, after getting splice frame, containing the splice, clear of the ship and lowering it to the bottom, each vessel, then about a quarter of a mile apart, commenced paying out in opposite directions. 9 p.m. Got on board Niagara's warp and her end of cable to make another splice for a second experiment. June 1st, 1 a.m., night. Electrical continuity gone, the cable having parted after two miles and all had been paid out. Since 1 a.m., engaged in hauling in our cable, recovered all our portion, and even managed to heave up the splice frame in perfect condition, besides 100 fathoms of Niagara's cable, which she had parted, fastened splice to stern of vessel, and seized operations. 9.23 a.m. Second experiment started paying out again. Weather very misty. 9.40. One mile paid out at strain 1,600 weight. Angle of cable 16 degrees with a horizon running out straight. Rate of ship 2. Cable 3. 9.45. Changed to lower hold. 9.56. Two miles out. Last mile in 16 and a half minutes. Strain 17 to 20 hundredweight. Angle of cable 20 degrees. 10.10. 10. Last of the three miles out in 14 minutes. 10.32 a.m four and a half miles out third experiment stopped ship lowered guard stoppered cable ten fifty buoy let go strain sixteen hundred weight when let go the cable being nearly up and down eleven o six running at rate of five and a half knots paying out strain twenty one to twenty three hundred weight varying cable shortly afterward parted through getting jammed in the machinery the subsequent experiments were mainly in the direction of buoying picking up and passing the cable from the stern to the bow sheave for picking up all of these operations were in turn successfully performed and finally in paying out a speed of seven knots was attained without difficulty during all this time, electrical communication had been maintained between the ships, and it is somewhat remarkable that through this more or less damaged cable, the electricians were able to work a needle instrument and obtain a deflection on it of 70 degrees. And now, the program being exhausted, the ships returned to Plymouth, 
on the whole the trip had proved eminently satisfactory the paying out machinery had worked well the various engineering operations had been successfully performed and the electrical working through the whole cable was perfect End of chapter 5